Hi, my name is Paul Hopkinson. Now today I'm going to show you how to paint a very detailed bird's eye and a very strong looking beak. Now subscribe and hit the bell to get notified whenever I post a brand new video here on YouTube. Now when you subscribe to my channel you're going to learn more about watercolour tips, techniques, materials and many other watercolour ideas using my 40 plus years of experience. So stay tuned, let's go. Right, so let's make a start. Now, you can see I've already made a start. I've got the drawing on the paper ready to go. And that's just solely to cut down the time here on the, on the video. But all I've done to get the drawing on the paper is use trace down paper. Now, I'd also recommend that you do it freehand if you can, okay? The reason why I've done it this way is just for the speed of the video more than anything. And just so I can get straight to that painting process. A lot of people um, prefer to do it this way because they find drawing difficult. As well, I know it's something you need to practice, I realise that, and I'd always kind of recommend practicing freehand drawing. So try to have a go freehand first, do it on some uh, on some scrap paper first of all. Um, I tend to use, you know, the paper you get for your printer, so printer paper is ideal for that. Draw it out, and then once you've got it drawn out, you can transfer it. Other than that, then you get the reference photo or the outline drawing. Put it on your paper. Like so, I've got some little marks I've made here so I can just reposition things. That's better. Then you get your trace down paper, which is this one, as I say. So shiny side down, pop it between the two sheets, and then trace over using the pencil. Okay, so, and a medium pressure. Don't press too hard, but you just need enough pressure just kind of make it mark through. That also depends on how thick the, um, the printer paper is as well, by the way, you find. So once you've got that trace through there, or as I say, make some little reference marks around the edge, so at least then you can reposition this back on if you need to at a later time. Okay, so the drawing's on the paper. So you can use a trace down paper, you can freehand it, or you can use a grid system, which is another way of doing it as well. Um, but once you've got the drawing on the paper, we can make a start on the painting. Yay! Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to be using Regina's watercolors for this particular tutorial. And you can see these are the ones here, look which I've done a little video on these by the way, so if you're interested in seeing that I'll put a link down below for you so you can see the video on when I kind of tested these paints out. I have done one of a painting with this by the way, so I'll just quickly grab that one second. And this is the one in question, there you go, it's a little hummingbird, I'm a bit zoomed in at the moment, but you can see the idea there. And uh, that's the first painting I've done with these particular paints. Now, I've been using watercolours for probably over 40 years now. And I've never used anything really different to Winsor & Newton. So with these paints, which are honey-based, they're handmade, they're very thick, they're very highly pigmented, so they go a long way. I was quite surprised, actually, how well, how well they work. Because I've never used anything different to what I normally use. You know, you get kind of, we you know what it's like, you get used to one method, don't you? So I'm going to go through the video using them paints. But if you haven't got those paints, which I know a lot of you won't have, don't worry. All you got to do... Have a look at the colours within my chart here and the colours I'm going to be using. So if you want to pause the video, I'll try and zoom in on that a little bit for you while I just hold it my finger. There you go. Got it? So I'll just zoom in on that. And then you can see these. Just, just pause the video and you can write down what we've got here. And just kind of make some reference marks or print it off or whatever you want to do. So you can see what colours you've got which are similar to the ones I've got here. Doesn't have to be the same. Just say look, look kind of similar. Okay? But as I say, I'm just having a go with these paints and trying to do a full video on how to paint this uh, this bee eater. Right then, I've got a brand new brush to use today, so I'm going to have to play with my double zero brush. Now I do have the brush which uh, came with a kit. This was a test brush, so it's not the one that comes with the usual kit. So um, I will be using this one for the light, for obviously the larger washes, but it's a little bit too big for the finer detail on, the, on this particular painting. As you know, we've got a selection of colours which are going to work from as well, and I'll see what we can do. So the first thing I want to do is give a little bit of colour in the palette, and I think what I might do, I'll just take the handle off this, because it's a little bit easier when it's a bit shorter like that for me. And I'm going to get probably a little bit, if I put that over the top of my paint so I can see what I've got. A little bit of chocolate, <laughs> okay. So a bit of chocolate. Now the good thing about these paints is that they're so rich, as I said earlier, it takes hardly any time to kind of work up the colour on it. So a little bit of chocolate. Oh, look at that already. That's lovely. Now, this does give quite a reasonable point in this particular brush. As I say, I do like to use my double zero brush because I've, I've just I've ever used it for, you know, for many years, as people who know my painting style will know that anyway. 
So the idea is, I'm just going to make sure that we've got the pencil marks defined. So what do I mean by that? When you go over the pencil marks with a colour, I'm not going to do the yellow areas with this because um, I don't want the brown standing out too much. This will seal the pencil onto the paper. Because when we start adding the watercolour washes over the top of this, you find very often the washes will just uh, make the pencil marks disappear. Then you end up having to kind of reposition your reference drawing over the top again and starting all over again, getting the details down there so you can see where things go. So all I want to do, anywhere where it's fairly dark, I'd say not around the outside edge though, especially anywhere like here. It's not too bad here actually because this is kind of black there, isn't it? And around the side there, just kind of seal it in. So I'm going to go all over this now, say not the outside edge as I mentioned, and just get these details down. So bear with me a minute. As you can see, I'm using the very tip of the brush. That's why I like to use a double zero, because you can see how fine we can get with this. This chocolate colour is a lovely colour, actually. It's, uh, it is a very nice colour to work with. And it's ideal. If it's watered down enough, you don't want it too strong. As I say, these paints are very strong, which is brilliant. You know, that's what I like. We don't want it too strong, we're just adding this outline on there. So a little bit more down there. I'm trying to see where the wings go actually. You can just see that on the photograph there. I'm going to put one or two smaller marks. In fact, here's what I'll do. I'll just take a little bit of paint off the brush first so it's not too kind of thick when it goes on the paper. Just add in, as far as there, there's a very light little marks in the direction the feathers go. And then the same will apply, let's get some more now, along here. Now when I load the brush up by the way, what I tend to do is roll the brush and pull away. So I kind of load it, roll it, and then very often if it's too much I'll dab it on some kitchen roll first. So load it, roll it, dab it, and carry on with that. Now if you do fancy having a go at a free tutorial as well, I do have one on my Patreon website if you fancy having a go at that. And that's how to paint a robin. Yeah, I know. And that's using different colours of the Windsor and Newton colours which I normally use. Um, but if you do fancy having a go at that, pop onto patreon.com forward slash a devon artist and you'll find me there anyway. And have a look at the free stuff. <laughs> it's quite a bit of free stuff on there. And uh, let me know how you get on. I'd love to kind of hear if you paint it, okay? So I'm just working my way down and just very lightly go over these lines. So I'm going to carry on now, as I say, and uh, I'll see in a little bit when I've just outlined some of the pencil marks on most of them, actually, in this case. Probably not so much the blue too much. I've done the outside of the eye, so we're done about doing the pupil, because we're going to paint that in black anyway. I think that'll do. Okay, right. So, oh, hang on. A little bit more blue. A bit of bluey green, that'll do. And do the wing feathers here as well, just the side feathers. Again, just to seal it in, that's all I want to do. Don't have the paint too thick when you do this. And that, that'll definitely do now, honestly. All right. Okay, so I'm going to give the chance to dry, which will take literally seconds here. Change the battery in the camera, and I'll be back to you very shortly. Now, I'm going to start painting the eye. Now, I usually start with the eye to begin with anyway, because it's one of those parts of an animal or a bird that I just like to look at because you've got that bit of life already on the paper when you start working for the rest of the, the detail as well. So it's just nice to kind of have that on there. So I'm going to go for the poppy red at the moment. So this is poppy and it's not the colour that I want just yet. But what you can get, if you get some test sheets of paper, now these are just scrap pieces of watercolour paper I normally use. Okay, and you can just give it a try. And what I tend to do, you can't see the tablet from here, but I'll offer that up to the picture and compare the colour. And that's a little bit too red for me. So if I just wash the brush out, always wash the brush out in between colours. Otherwise you end up tainting the other colour with a colour, another colour. For example, if I decide to go for the yellow right this minute, for the daffodil, that's going to be turned into orange, isn't it? You know. So this one is now going to be rose. Okay, so I'm going to mix that with a poppy. And we'll try that on here. And I'll compare that. Now that's a little bit too far. So I'll wash the brush out again. Come back in with a little bit more poppy. Kind of adjust it in between as you go along. So that's not far away. A little bit more poppy. So basically it's more poppy. 
a little bit of rose. <laughs> this is like uh, cadmium red, really, this, this particular one, so bear that in mind. Okay, but as I say, compare these to your own colour palettes, and you see what I mean when you do this. And just paint with something that looks quite similar to it. Now, okay, for that colour, they're ready to go. This will just be the first wash of colour for the iris. That's what we're looking for to begin with. So back to my double zero brush, and here we go. This is a lovely small paper, it really is. Nice travel size. I mean, that's the idea behind this when you buy anything like this. It is a, a travel paper. I still think that just needs a bit more poppy in there. To be honest, it's a little bit too purple. I'm just going to add that in first of all. Now I'm looking carefully at the photograph of this. I want to make sure. So when you see me stop painting, it's because I keep looking at the photo. I want to make sure that I've got the detail in the right place. So I've got the shape of the eye. That is important. It really is important. It's not completely round this. It's a bit of an oval. So it comes out to about there. Now you can see with this brand new brush I'm using. These are quite cheap actually. These cost me um, about, about £3.50. I don't know what that is in dollars. I suppose it depends where you are. So it could be about $4, something like that. So it's not that expensive. Um, and I tend to use one of these for every... I don't know, two or three paintings, believe it or not. But when you think each painting normally is a lot bigger than this, normally consists of thousands of brush strokes, it does well. It does well for the price. It's okay. Can't complain. So then fill it in again, go over the same area again with another layer. What I found with these particular paints as well, they do layer really well. Um, which means the colour is going to get richer with every colour, every every uh, layer of this I put on there, it's going to get deeper and deeper. So for example, where you see on here, that's very thin there, so that's like having one layer, one kind of watery wash. Where it's congregated around here at the moment, imagine that being four or five layers of the same colour, so I can go over the top again, you know, and so on and so on. So I'm just going to wash out, I'm going to go a little bit more, just a tiny bit more poppy. I might as well just stay with poppy to begin with and just add a little bit of that um, rose to it. One thing I do normally do, which I've not done in this case, only because I just want to get straight to the painting, is to test out the colours first, okay? But I'm trying to do off the cuff this particular video, just literally straight onto the paper and just give it a go. But um, what I would normally do, as I say, is get loads of sheets of paper, well, I say loads, just quite a few odd watercolour sheets. I'm trying to see if I've got anything here to show you. I think I haven't got a lot. You know, things like this. This is a test one I did for something else as well. So test out your colours first before you do, do the main painting itself. As I say, I'm not setting a very good example because I've not done that in this case. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to do that chance to dry and then once it's dry we can start thinking about adding more detail in there. Because at the moment all that is is just one, well, two Two, color, two coats of that same colour, but I do want to add a little bit of darker shade in there to give a bit of a curve within the eye, all right? So, okay, next thing we need to do is work on the beak, and for that, I'm going to get the bigger brush. I'm going to get a little bit of coal. There you go, I know. My dad used to work down the pit, which he did. <laughs> true, very true. Now, as you can see, I've not wetted these paints down to begin with. That's how quick you can just get your colour ready. But within that coal colour, I want to have a little bit of blue, I think. And I might go for... Let's go for a little bit of blueprint, which is this one here. And just add that into the coal. And if I test that one out, you can see that's the kind of colour I've got. Yeah, I think that'll do to begin with. And that'll do for the first wash over the top of the beak. Now what I might do, I'm just going to put the handle back on this a minute, just briefly. Just for the initial wash on the beak itself. Now, wet the beak first of all. You probably need to do this two or three times actually, because it depends how warm it is in your room. I mean here it's very warm, so it's about 24, 25 degrees. And because of that, obviously the paints are drying very quickly at the moment. Allow it to soak into the paper a little bit. Now, I've never used Strathmore paper before, so this is new to me. I've never used these paints before. Well, I have. I did like one painting. Not before yesterday, anyway. Um, so because of that, everything that I'm using, including this brush, is all new to me at the moment. So it's a complete unknown for me at the moment. So that's the good thing about all of this. And it's going to work away around the eye. Remember, this is just that initial wash. Okay, the foundation layer 
So all this is, just to get some color on the paper, and we'll be using this foundation layer to put all the details on over the top as we go along. So you just need that. And then we'll get that blacky blue, okay, so the coal and the blueprint, and we'll just pop that onto the paper first of all. Be very careful to keep your shape right on the beak. If you're not confident with a larger brush, just go for your smaller brush again. Excuse the traffic behind if you can hear it. Just very lightly. I may tidy this up later on. Well, I will tidy it up as I go along. So this is just that initial foundation layer, just to get a bit of color on the paper. And so you have to remember these particular paints, they are very rich. I know I said it earlier on, but they are really rich. And because of that, you have to remember that when you're using them, because obviously <laughs> you, the pigment's very, very, very good. You know, you um, end up putting too much color on if you're not careful. So that's why I say when you do a test like on here, you can see my test there is quite dark. Test it out first before you put it onto your watercolor surface, okay? So otherwise you'll be uh, having to kind of take it off again. One thing I found with these paints, by the way, is that it does, they do lift quite easily. So you can take them off. The colours I've used so far anyway. Okay, so that'll do for the initial wash. I might just go towards the eye. That'll do. Okay, try not to touch that eye just yet though, so we need it to fully dry. Okay, once that's dry, what we'll do, we'll start working on the eye, get the eye done, then really kind of define this beak and get that shape just right. Because at the moment, it looks a little bit of a mess. Well, it's not, you know what I mean? It's just that foundation wash. Okay, tidy that up, tidy that up. Okay, leave it. Right, so see in a minute when it's nice and dry. Right then, it's all nice and dry now. Now what I would normally do if it's a larger sheet of paper, I'd have a sheet of paper like this to kind of put my hand on, so my hand's like that normally on it. But we don't need that in this case because it's nice and small. So I'm just gonna push that up to about there. Okay, ready? Here we go. Now then, the eye. I'm gonna get a little bit of this blacky blue a little bit, okay, and start working on the inside of the eye ring itself. Again, we're looking at the overall shape of this because I want to make sure the shape is right. So it's not round. I'm just delighted to touch it. You have to remember that with this, it's very minuscule. So you can print this off as big as you want to go, okay? So I'm going to provide the uh, outline drawing a little bit bigger for you to use. So you're more than welcome to paint it bigger than this. This is a challenge for me to paint obviously a head of a bird to this size. But that's okay, I like a good challenge. Which is also why I'm using different paints. So again, over the same lines once again, tax that say a little bit darker in tone, which is what we're trying to do. So you're gradually building up the darkness as you go along. Traditionally with watercolors you go from light to dark. So you start off with the lightest of shades and then go very dark. Some people do light, then dark, then the mid-tones. Okay, so you can do it that way around if you want to. I normally go from light to dark and kind of build up a little bit. But as you can see with the eye, there's no need for that. Okay, so that's the first one. <laughs> and then what I want to do, it's very light. They just dampen down the red on the iris and then just touch that black towards it. If it doesn't move, we can add a little bit more black in there as well. So just get a little bit more actually. I don't want to completely fill in that red with some dark. If it goes in there, we can lift it back out again. There you go, just kind of soften it down. And they've got the same thing as well for the top of the eye. Now it's quite dark. Where this highlight is, you can just see the highlight here a lot. The highlight is that the, well, just right above it, it's really dark in there. So I'm just going to lightly go over there for now so I can work out where it is. All I'm doing really is mapping it out. And then I'll go over the top again, looking at the angles on the photograph. And my eyes are constantly flicking backward and forward to that photo at the moment, just to make sure that I can see exactly where I want to go. And the same again down there. Now for the outer ring, again map it out first, try and look at the shape, make sure you get the shape right. If 
For example, here it splits into two parts. So you've got a little bit there, you've got this little bit here. Here. You can tell I'm a northerner, can't you? Hey, up duck or right? I know. So I used to speak. I'm from Derbyshire, which is um, in the middle of the UK, just about anyway. <laughs> I was also born in Manchester as well. Now Manchester, if you recall, is um, Coronation Street. It's a little bit more coal than that, I think. So if you watch Coronation Street, that's based in Manchester. So the way they talk is where I used to talk. After spending many years living in the south of England, especially in Tor Bay, in Devon, and now live in North Devon, and also work in retail for quite a few years, my accent has changed a little bit because people couldn't understand half the words I was saying. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> so anyway, so going around this again, and remember every layer you add, it's going to get darker and darker. Now I'm going to put the other little line, think about a rope shape on the curve of a rope. The other little line around this outer ring, just for now, this is just kind of mapping out as I say, I'm just working out where things go. This paint is drying ever so quick here today, as I said, so it's uh, I'll keep re-wetting the paints. Just a few lines here and there. I can see also on the top of the side, just here, look. Excuse a racket outside if you can hear it. I said we've got builders nearby building a new park and tennis courts in our tiny, tiny village where we live. I still don't think it's needed, but anyway, that's my argument. Right, okay. So working my way down. <laughs> and to there. Okay, so that's the outer ring kind of mapped out, ready to go. And then we need to do the pupil after this. So I just want to make sure we've got these little tiny marks in there. Because this is a very large photograph, which, which I'm giving you today, and it's one by a cracking photographer called Roger Wasley. Um, really, really clever chap, he really is, with his photos. He allows me to use all these photographs, which he puts on the, on the internet for me, and for the people, obviously, not just for me. But yes, he's a cracking photographer, so well worth uh, getting in touch with or looking at his work anyway. Now I'm going to paint carefully around the highlight. Now, if you do paint that in, don't worry, it's not a problem. All we need to do is add a little spot of kind of watercolour white or white gouache in there instead. Anything that's opaque. And the watercolour white, which I've got here, which I'll show you in a bit. We haven't got one with this kit. But I do use it, and I will probably use it within this painting anyway. Um, is an opaque watercolour white so I suggest if you do look for watercolour white as well opaque I prefer because it does cover and white gouache also covers quite well so just painting in the pupil making sure you reserve that little white of the paper for the highlight so there we are we nearly got an eye already look Whee! just want that little bit of life in there as I say that's all we're after very lightly graze over the just inside there that's better okay now then we're going to start working on the detail on this as well so looking underneath the eye there's a thicker band of dark underneath there I say my paint is drying there it's a quick so thicker band of dark just there and to there now with all watercolors even Regina's watercolors here they will dry a little bit lighter how much lighter depends on how much pigment you got within the paint. So you find the wall dry lighter. So allowing for that as well if you want to. And I think the tip really is from me, as I tell all my patrons on Patreon. I know, advert again, but it's true. Got a lot of people on Patreon now, especially from America as well. Um, is that the best way you can do this is just, you know, allow it to be light to begin with and gradually build up the layers as you go along. So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm looking at the direction that these lines go in. I tend to akin it to a clock face. And what I mean by that is that at the moment, for example, these lines here lot, they're going towards about two, between two and three o'clock. Then three o'clock. Then down towards four o'clock. See what I mean? In that general direction. Or you can do it the other way around, you know, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, ten o'clock. But if you do it that way around, it kind of keeps you on form, kind of keeps you you know, in tune where things go. 
But also what I'll tend to do as well, which I'm not doing it, in, not doing it yet, but I probably will do later on, is put some reference marks in. So every now and then I'll put a few little marks here and there with that appropriate colour before I start adding all this colour in. Because then, when you get carried away with the detail, and there's a lot of detail, you don't lose your way. You don't end up painting the, the lines in the wrong direction. Believe me, I've done it. And then you think, oh no, it's all facing the wrong way. And it's these lines and the washes underneath which will help create that shape, the overall shape of the uh, of the painting as well, of the animal, the bird, whatever it might be. The direction of the feathers or the fur will help determine the overall shape of the painting itself. Now this is the second layer of the same colour. As you can see, it's getting darker all the time. Think about overlapping the lines as you go along. You can see this gradually building up as we go along. This will just be the first or second layer, just as we gradually add these lines in. We don't want to just fill it in, because we need some of the light to show through from the paper. And then over the top of the eye. And then down the side. Okay, I'm going to just give that chance to dry just for a minute or two, and then I'll be back with you straight after. Right, so back to it. It started to dry a little bit now. Just give it a chance while well, it doesn't take long to say in this heat at the moment, which is good really, so that's quite handy. But also it can be a bit of a hindrance because you haven't got much time to work on it. But see how quick it's dried within my palette here. So I'm gonna get some more of the coal colour. As you can see, as I said, you don't need much of it to kind of just work it up quite quickly. And a little bit more of the blueprint. Oh, look at that, lovely. I think I need a bit more coal, actually. I don't want it too blue. Was that not a Madonna song? I think it was, wasn't it? Oh no, that's true blue, sorry. I'll shut up now. Carry on, Paul. Get painting. So, here we go. Again, we're gonna go over the same area again, just to show you what I'm working on. And, and you've got to try and see where it's darker on the photo as well. I can just see here, around this area here, you can see how it kind of sweeps up towards two o'clock that direction there is darker there and gradually gets lighter around the side a uh, little bit more so load your brush up barely touching the paper looking at the angle that the lines have got to go say so this is different paper to me I've never used this paper and papers do perform in different ways you find that with all the papers when you test them out very often the colors will lay differently the sizing within the paper, which stops it like, acting like a blotting paper, tends to vary as well within different manufacturers. So that's something worth noting. Um, in fact, some, some of the more kind of expensive papers or mid-range mid upwards papers, very often the sizing or this additive, which stops it acting like a blotting paper, as I say, is added within the pulp. So before it's actually flattened into paper or gone through cold rolls in this case. So you find that, whereas some of the cheaper brands tend to have the sizing kind of added as a coating on the top of the paper. So well worth noting. And obviously um, when you stretch paper as well, I was talking about stretching paper before. If you do stretch paper, you don't need stretches with it being on a block pad. Then you find that um, if you stretch paper, if you wet it too much and start working on it too much and trying to dry it, you can kind of ruin the sizing on the paper if you're not careful. So you have to do it very carefully. Unless, it's got the size and added when it was a pulp stage so it's part of the paper now you can gradually see this building up because what I'm doing looking at the photograph again I'm just making sure that these lines overlap and I can see it's darker down here now so I'm going to go darker do it all in lines don't just fill it in because you want to show these lines in between keep reloading that brush doesn't matter which brush you use as long as it's got a decent tip on it. As I said, I could probably use the one that Regina supplied with this one. But when you're confident with a particular brush, and I'm using different paints, different paper, I just want to use my brush <laughs> for this area and for the detail work. Right, okay, so I just had somebody at the door, so I had to kind of leave this alone, which means it's all started to dry now. So I've got to recharge everything, reload, a little bit more blueprint. A little bit goes a long way. So I like a palette. Okay, continue. Here we go. Now, as I say, you need this foundation layer underneath because if you don't put that on, 
you find the paint won't take to the paper properly. It's kind of breaking away and leaving gaps in between too much. Kind of prepares the paper ready when you have this detail over the top. Can't put in pants in a bit. I've only legged it up and down the stairs, you know. I don't know. 50 year old man. <laughs> Terrible. Now it's darker here. Again, I don't want to fill it in. It goes towards about 2 o'clock. The direction of the lines. Now you can see the shape form and see what I mean. So this is, when you look at the photograph, you can see that on there. How dark that is. I'm just going to bring a few more over the top now. Okay, that will do for now. Because what I want to do is start filling in the other side of the eye before we work on the beak. Again, leave the gaps so where the, the main outer part of the eye goes, the eyelid, just around the side there. Put a few little more specks in there as well. And we can put a few highlights in there as well at one point, can we? We can add a bit of watercolor white in there. I'm looking at the direction that these feathers go. You can just see the fine lines going through to the top, just about there. So I'm going to add those in. I'll do the same with the bottom as well, actually, saying that whilst we're here. Just a few down there. Now, when you position your palette, you can see I've got my palette to the left-hand side of me, and that's obviously because I'm left-handed. So it depends on what's most comfortable for you. Now, normally, this would be a little bit higher up the pad, um, or well, my painting board surface, because obviously I need it for video in. So that's why it's quite low down. So I'd normally have that kind of position slightly higher. Okay. And just down the side, if you only bang in, then got, we've got builders to say nearby, so they do make a bit of a racket at the moment, but they got work to do. And then just very lightly, just outlining the inside edge of the two parts of the beak, so the upper and lower mandible, and then fill in the rest of this area. I'm still going to do it via lines, though, even though you can barely see those lines on the photograph. So we're going to add those in just for now, just kind of helps. The overall painting. And I think the beauty about anything like this as well, if you do it this way around, once you step back and add a cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, glass of whiskey, no, forget that, cup of tea, then obviously you come back with fresh eyes. So it's wise to just have a bit of a break from a painting. Come back with fresh eyes, and you see it slightly differently sometimes, and you see little areas where you think, oh, that needs adjusting, that's not quite right. So kind of bear that in mind, okay? Okay, keep saying okay. Right, just get some reference marks back in there. I can just see my pencil marks underneath. And this is where the nostril goes, just there. Very lightly go over the top. And I think we're about there. So the next thing I want to work on before we put any more layers on that, if we do decide to, is obviously get some layers on the beak. Now, as for the beak, what we've got to think about as a colours to begin. Remember, we've got the, the basic foundation wash on. So if we do one part of the beak at a time, okay, so do the upper mandible first. Stick with the same kind of colour we've already got down here, which is the, um, if you remember, the coal and the blueprint. But, I'm tell you what I might do, I might put a little bit more blueprint in there. Just to begin with. Remember, we can go darker as we go along. Let's just work on the first layer first. Now, I want to very lightly just define the very edge of this beak now, just using the very tip of the brush. Now, this has got a quite a slight curve to it, so I'm just going to make sure we've got a bit of a curve just about appearing. And it gets lighter towards the tip, so I'm going to put a little bit of paint there initially. I'll, we'll soften that down as we go through the process. And the same with the lower part of this top beak, if you know what I mean. So that goes down to about there. Got a bit of a smile on this as well, I think. Just to there. <laughs> Got a bit of a smile, what am I like? Just down towards the eye, following that line down. Now for the nostril again, which is there. And this kind of works its way out gradually into the beak itself. Okay, right, now we've got that defined, what we need to do is fill it in. 
That's it really. Job done. Now we'll fill it in. I'm going to wet the brush first and put some water down. So dampen the paper. A little bit more. I'd say it's quite warm as I mentioned today, so therefore it's drying very quickly. And then <laughs> re wet, get a bit more black or coal. More blueprint. And add this colour in into the damp paper. And we're going to gradually build this up as we go along. Work into that very edge, trying to go over that edge there. I need to just bring that up a slight bit more because it needs to be slightly more curved than that. Got a very gradual curve. And then towards the nostril. It's actually lighter on the tip of this beak. I don't know if it's food. I've got no idea. Actually, it might have been some McDonald's. Possible. Who knows? So I'm going to make sure it's a little bit lighter on there. Then again, another layer. So this is drying, just got that nice sharp edge on the tip of the beak, on the edge of the beak, I mean. And then working my way down to you, babe. So working my way down. And we've got a blob of water there. Get a bit more coal actually into that now. And we're going to gradually build the beak up as we go along. A little bit more in there. I'm trying to get darker just towards there and the beauty about all of this is that you can lightly blend it you can lift paint off as well if it's too much add some little marks in there scumble in other words just using the side of the brush a little bit so not the very tip see what i mean so you can scumble it in there sometimes a shaky hand helps as well and some of you will say paul i've got a shaky hand anyway well i know but so have I sometimes, believe it or not. I may be a fine artist, but I've also got a... I've never got a... I've never got a steady hand. Not really steady hand. That's why all my paintings, my hand is supported on the paper. Remember years ago, I used to do a lot of um, kind of oil painting. I used to have to use a, a mal stick. I don't know if you know those. It's a piece of wood with a bit of chamois leather on the end. Um, wash that brush out before I went to another colour pool. And they used to really help kind of support your hand. You know, you don't need that, obviously, when you're working on a, on a table like this, but sometimes a little pad underneath your hand as well might help. Just give it that extra support. If you find it difficult to kind of get the details down, don't grip the brush like, uh, you know, like you don't let it go. <laughs> so don't really grip it tight. Just gradually hold it nice and loose-ish. You can see how I've got mine in my hand here and how far down, just above the ferrule actually I'm kind of holding this at the moment. I don't really take much notice of that, but but some people hold it that far back and it gives you a bit more of a freedom within the brush strokes. But I don't like the tight work as you know when I'm working on anything like this. I just keep it nice and tight and fine. A little few little marks at the front. Okay. That'll do for now for the top part of the beak or the Shall we call it again? The upper, the upper mandible. Okay. So that I do for that for now. And then we're going to do the same thing on the bottom part. And for that, I'm going to go to a little bit of music. Okay. And then we can fine tune anything that needs kind of lightening or darkening within the beak itself.
Okay, right, so that should just about do for the beak for now, other than the highlights. I mean, what you can do for highlights, you can lift off a little bit of paint here and there. And all I mean by that, get the tip of your brush, very lightly work over one little area like that, and then very quickly lift that paint off. So you can see on this tissue, not the old one, this tissue, that's the colour I've just taken off. So that way you can just pull off a few little tiny, tiny, eenty weenty little tiny highlights as you go along. Just add a bit more interest to the beak as well, more texture to the beak itself. So you can do that, or if you want to, we can have a little bit of watercolour white, which I'm going to very shortly, just to kind of give it that kind of extra, a little extra zing really. Right, a little bit more there. And just down to there. The good thing about Regina's colours as well is that they do lift quite well. I think I mentioned it earlier on, but they do lift off uh, fairly well compared to some colours which tend to stain the paper. Right, so that's the eye on the beak just about done. What I did say I want to do is add a little bit of watercolour white. Now, I'm going to use, which is this one here, this is uh, one by SAA. There are a different variety of watercolour whites on the market, okay? This particular one is an opaque white. I know that because it says it on the tin, well, on the tube, but I also know it because it does say on the back as well. So have a look on the tubes in question. So this one, permanent SAA, so it's quite a permanent mix, and it's also opaque. Some watercolour whites are transparent, some are semi-transparent, some are semi-opaque. I know, I know it's a bit of a minefield. But it's well worth looking around and I prefer to buy the opaque versions. Now, instead of watercolour white, you can use white gouache as well. Um, because gouache is, is well, it's a, it's a watercolour basically, but it's, a, it's an opaque watercolour. So you could use white gouache instead of watercolour white. So that's another option for you as well. But have a look on the market. The other one I've, I did notice, by the way, uh, which was a good quality one, was a Windsor & Newton Professional Opaque White as well. I did find that one, and that was quite a good one. I did buy that one in as well. And just been, give me a minute, I'll see if I can dig that one out while I'm talking to you. And I did a test on Patreon with my members on there, on one of the videos. It's still on there now, so if you do go on to Patreon at any given time, you'll find the video. Now, the ones in question are these here, lot. So, as, as I mentioned, I've done a video on my Patreon channel on all these different watercolour whites and how they perform, and which ones are opaque, you know, are some sticky, and do they cover up the detail, which is the, which I need to do, that's why I like the opaque white. And how does it kind of perform when you add a watercolour over the top, so you have something like a red or a brown or a blue or whatever colour you want to use? What happens to the white underneath? Does it blur? Does it stay put? So that's a test I did on a video on Patreon as well, so just kind of give us some ideas, but that's the one I'd recommend if you can't get the SAA one, or the designer gouache, because that's quite a good one, a good one as well. But that particular one, which is the Windsor Newton Professional Watercolour White. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna pop a little bit of this into my little mixing area here. I don't want too much, because it does dry out quite quick. And this is very, very creamy, so I do need a little bit of water. So if I get my pipette, just a little bit of water in there. There you go. That's all I should need really for now. Now you don't want too much on it because obviously you don't want to waste it anyway. You can reactivate it anyway, but I might take this off once I've used it because I need the rest of the mixing tray on this one. So back to the painting. Here we go. I want to add a little bit of detail here and there, not too much. Barely touching the paper, using the very tip of the brush. I've not overloaded the brush. Just add some bit of highlights here and there. So it's quite white on the on the tip, with gaps in between, and there are a few odd specks here and there as well around the the top part of the beak here, a few little tiny lines, barely touching the paper. Two airs in air, that's all I'm using. Kind of very tiny. And if you find it's too much, just take a little bit off on some tissue paper, and then come back in, and because your brush is a little bit drier give you finer marks as well, so it's well worth uh, just trying that out. And I always say to my patrons on, on Patreon, my members on Patreon, as well, is with watercolour white, less is definitely best, okay? So less is best. And that's because it's so easy to get carried away when you add it on. Oh, this is effective, it's working. 
So less is definitely best. So it's well worth doing that. But say you can always come back and add more later on. Once you've had a coffee break or, you know, you just kind of stood away for five minutes. Come back and then look at it again and think, I could do a little bit more on there. Just in places. And that should be plenty for there. Now for around the eye. Now this is quite small here. So I'm going to have a quick look. There's a small little lot there, just there. Tiny, tiny little dots. Just brighten that little dot, the highlight in the eye a little bit there. And a few little marks. Get a little bit more there. A few little marks just around the eye. Not too many. I don't want it too bright. I don't want to look like a big halo around the eyes. <laughs> just a few. And that should just about okay and that really is it i mean you could add a little bit over the top of the black here if you wanted to but i don't think it's needed there okay so that's all you need to do to add a few highlights using watercolor white or white gouache um to your painting okay so next thing we need to think about is working on the foundation washes for the body right so there we go now part two and part three are available on my patreon website now don't panic these are completely free of charge to you there's no email addresses exchange no nothing i'll even give you the outline drawing and the reference photograph to have a go at painting this lovely bee eater so pop along to uh, patreon.com have a look in the links in the description down below for both parts part two and three and if you want part one as well and uh, please as i said let me know how you got on i'd love to see your version of this bee eater painting and above all, have fun. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you gleaned some information from the way I tend to paint. So, I'll see you again in part two, but this time on Patreon. Now, if you'd like to have a go at painting another free watercolor lesson, and this time of a robin, pop along to my website, www.patreon.com forward slash the Devon Artist. The robin comes completely free with the reference photograph and the outline drawing as well. Other than that, remember to click on like, subscribe, and the bell icon. And don't forget, I've got over 90 hours of video tuition just for you to have a go with. Bye for now.